Hi, Steve Monteghetti, Chef to Mission 2018 Commonwealth Games. Also Commonwealth Games gold medalist, four-time Olympian, three top tens and a couple of world records along the way as well for the half. So, And you're listening to The Physical Performance Show. And the winner is... Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. <laughs> Absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, Let's go. Listeners, welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show, the show that takes you behind the scenes of how the world's top and most inspiring physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs and the lows of the journey in getting there. Today's show, as always, is lovingly brought to you by Pogo Physio. We exist to help you perform at your physical best, through our industry first fixed price and unlimited access two six and 12 week finish line programs we want everyone who walks through the doors of pogo to get what we call their high five moment that's the moment where they've finished rehabilitation and they don't need to come back as a client you're finished we want that because we know that that's where you get the best performance gains and you're truly not just out of pain but you're truly rehabilitated and the fixed fee unlimited access just opens the doors so that all of our patients who are on the finish line programs can get the very best treatment that they would benefit from even if that's daily attendance as opposed to the treatment that typically is session to session and based on someone's budget Uh, our therapies include hands-on treatment active rehabilitation with state-of-the-art equipment such as the anti-gravity treadmill known as the alter g whole body vibration therapy, and also oodles of clinical Pilates classes running all week long. We also use a state-of-the-art exercise prescription app where we can develop a program for you and edit that between your start and your finish line of your time with us. So if you want more information, jump over to pogophysio.com.au and you'll be able to explore the world of the finish line programs with Pogo Physio. Massive thank you to you, the faithful listeners who have been reviewing the Physical Performance Show. Thanks so much. Reviews really do help this show be more visible and into the earbuds of more people who, just like you, are looking to perform and pursue their physical best performance. A massive thank you to a show listener, Robin62. And Robin rated the program five stars, and Robin's comments were, The Physical Performance Show explores the stories of our awe-inspiring athletes. Brad has the ability to make to take me into their lives, helping me to feel their dedication, motivation, and effort. I particularly enjoy listening to these interviews on my runs, but I've also been known to tune in while walking the dogs, doing housework, or even when mowing the lawn. Each and every interview teaches me something new and motivates me to train smarter. Thanks, Brad. Keep them coming. Robin, thank you. I will be sure to keep them coming. And uh, your feedback is really uh, fuel for me. So thank you so much, Robin. And listeners, if you'd like to leave a review, really simple, over on iTunes, needs to be on a desktop uh, as a, or a laptop, that is, as opposed to a mobile or tablet. Uh, and inside iTunes, you click ratings and review, and you can leave a brief comment and rate it one star if you like it, think it's okay, or think it's terrible. Five stars if you think it's great. So thanks, Robin, and thanks, show listeners, for any reviews come in. Last week, we caught up with Charlotte Perdue, UK marathoner, who has her sights firmly set on the Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games Marathon, and Charlotte shared some great insights into marathon running. And Charlotte's interview is really a nice segue over to another running guest who is internationally acclaimed for his outstanding career, and none more so than here on the shores of Australia. And I'm referring to today's guest, Steve Monaghetti. Monas, as he is so affectionately referred to amongst the running and sporting community here in Australia. Where do we start in terms of introducing Steve Monaghetti? 
Uh, the biography is longer, as I said last week in introducing Steve for this week's show, uh, than my two arms. Uh, Moners generously caught up with me uh, while he was on the Gold Coast, actually on the day that was the one-year countdown to the 2018 Commonwealth Games. And I know that Steve had a big day full of formal engagements as the chief the mission for the Australian team for the 2018 Commonwealth Games and a, and a Com Games ambassador. And from there, he kindly and graciously popped into Pogo Physio, where we recorded the interview. And then I ushered Steve back to his next engagement, uh, which was further work for the Commonwealth Games. So Steve, for those that know him, Moners is so active in the running community here in Australia. Rarely does there seem to be a weekend where Steve's not featured somewhere, giving back, helping people on their journey uh, as such a great ambassador. So uh, to the biography though, let me do this incredible athlete and incredible uh, man some justice with uh, an outline of his accomplishments. Now we all know Steve's won a lot and done a lot, but really when you sit back and, uh, and take it in, it's quite, quite outstanding. Steve obviously hailed from, hails from Ballarat uh, in Victoria. It's been his, uh, from what I know, I believe, his lifelong home. And Moners uh, grew up with his first representation for Australia coming at the 10, 000, in the 10,000 metres at 1986 Commonwealth Games in Edinburgh. We talk about that race in this interview. Moners also unexpectedly got a start in the marathon in the 86 Com Games in Edinburgh, finishing with the bronze medal. Off the back of that, Moners went on four years later to take the silver medal, and then off the back of that, Moners went on at the Commonwealth Games in 94 in Canada to take the marathon to, uh, title. So, marathon Com Games champion in 94. Steve's also represented Australia at four Olympic Games, starting his Olympic campaign in Seoul, where he finished the race in fifth in a time of two hours, 11 minutes, 49. And then in Sydney, Steve made his Olympic exit from the uh, Olympic stage with an incredible 10th place in the Sydney Olympic Games, finishing uh, at the age of 38. Yeah, just remarkable. In addition to Steve's Commonwealth Games and Olympic Games successes, Steve's also been the City to Surf winner four times, the Mayor of the Commonwealth Games Village in 2006, and the Chief of Mission in the 2010 and 2014 installments of the Commonwealth Games. Just recently, in fact, this month uh, of the interview, Steve was inducted, fittingly so, into the Australian Athletics Hall of Fame. In addition to all these accolades, Steve's also been the winner of the Berlin Marathon in 1990, the winner of the Tokyo International Marathon in 1994, and has actually been the previous holder of three world best for the half marathon in 1990, 92, and 1993. And lastly, Steve's had six World Athletics Championships outings. In 97 in Athens, Steve picked up the bronze medal in the marathon, which was, it is and was such an incredible, incredible performance. So you are in for a real treat, listener. Whether you're a running fan or not, you're going to take so much away from this great runner, this great Australian. Steve's still actively running himself, and he shares around the journey of going from uh, international standards of running to uh, what Steve humorously refers to as a maybe the longest streak of PW's personal worsts as his times over the years have declined. However, what I love is he's still out there pushing himself and also inspiring others. Steve shares around uh, his most inspiring athlete. Uh, he shares around the toughest athlete he ever raced. He shares around his most loved and disliked sessions and so much more. So Get set, let's get ready. Here we go, Steve Monaghetti. Listeners, joining me today in person is a running icon, certainly here in Australia and definitely internationally. And uh, I'll share a little memory as we get going today with Steve Monaghetti. Uh, but to have Steve 
join us today is Symbolic Day. It's actually one year out from uh, the launch of the 2018 Commonwealth Games here on the Gold Coast, of which Steve uh, will be the chief de mission. I don't know how my French is there, Steve. You can correct me. Mm -hmm. Um, But to have you here today, mate, I know you've got a full schedule, uh, multiple functions on, and you've um, willingly given your time to come and share to our listenership around some insights from your career. It's just a real honour. So, Steve, thanks for joining us tonight. No worries. A pleasure. Great. Thanks for having me in. And special day exciting day and I think this time in 365 days i'll be frocking up for the opening ceremony i'm assuming so it'll be all happening so frocking literally have you got your outfit already organized steve uh not quite no no but it's uh it's you know and it's one of those things the opening ceremony is always a pretty symbolic whilst a lot of people don't march or can't march often because of competition it's still you know i think it's probably that moment you're most proud of pulling on that australian singlet when you can march out as a team under or behind and, and under the australian flag so it's um it's quite symbolic can you remember a time uh, we'll go there now steve from your career where it was a really memorable of all the olympic games out in for yourself for mm. likewise commonwealth games and you know multiple world athletics championships in there was there one really memorable opening ceremony for you across your career? Oh, I missed a few, to be honest, uh, because I, we're on the last day, I'd often come in late, but I will never forget the last one, Sydney Olympics. You know, we, Troopy and I especially went up. We were staying down at uh, Sutherland National Park, or Australian National Park down in Sutherland, but we went up just particularly to make sure we marched at the uh, opening ceremony there, and that was fantastic. Obviously, you know, being in front of a home crowd was, was awesome. Oh, I mean, what a games it was. Uh, I was at that stage 2019 turning 20 and, um, you know, it was to think we had the Olympic Games in our home soil and obviously that was your professional send-off uh, yeah. from, a, you know, which you competed in that one at 38 years of age and had another top or top 10 you finished 10th yeah sort of it's kind of it's well, technically it's, yeah. top 10 isn't it? i'm never sure on you know i feel bad when i say top 10 i always kind of think you're inside the top 10 but well, you tenth, are. 10 zero 10 to 10 right there so, we count it so mate it was an incredible run you know another mm-hmm. another solid run from uh, your, your marathon days steve i want to throw something a little bit curly to you out of the gate and that's what's one thing that scares steve monaghetti Spiders. I'm not a big fan of spiders, to be perfectly honest. So not good being an Australian and scared of spiders, is it? But um, and funnily enough, because lots of people, you know, people would would think I don't like spiders because you know they they they're intrusive, so they're in the house. Because people would think being a runner, I'd be afraid of snakes because that's what we see. But no, fine with snakes, no worries at all. We see a few out on the runs in Ballarat, but um, you know they get it. They they respect. My environment, I respect theirs, whereas spiders don't tend to have the same... They don't play by the same rules. <laughs> Any close encounters, mate, of the crawly, creepy, crawly kind over all your kilometres run? Oh, a few in Ballarat, but, yeah, not too, um, not too, nothing too stressful or to worry about. What about the snakes? Any uh, close encounters out in your, your runs over the years? We've had a lot up at Falls Creek. I remember on one run, I reckon we saw 10 on one run up at uh, up on the Wednesday, run out to Spee on Cope, and it was quite... I think they were all sunning themselves out there. There and uh, gee, we we're almost, um, you know, it makes you lift your legs a bit higher when you've got a few snakes on the path. Just this is their, their backyard and we're intruding on it, but they weren't moving too much. And they were some big, big snakes what too. What colour were they? They were brown snakes. Oh, yeah. mate. No, mm-hmm. mate. And uh, Steve, of all your accomplishments through your career, it's obviously a, um, an iconic career. Uh, you get this asked this question, I'm sure, you know, often, but is there one one accomplishment that stands above the rest and if there is why hmm, I've, I've got to cover it depends what mood i'm in on that one world world championships in 97 was pretty significant because we started at uh, the town of marathon and ran the old route in and finished in the old stadium we were the only the men's and women's marathons were the only events that finished in the old stadium and i, I had my best world runs i won a, uh, i was third there so i won a bronze medal and uh, and i think it was i was 35 so I was old or seemed to be old uh, was in hot weather hot and humid conditions in Athens I was from Ballarat people said I couldn't run in the hot weather so there were a lot of things that I ticked a lot of boxes that day that people had doubted me for and uh, so that was probably my most significant run and personally for me to start at marathon run that historical route and then to finish in the old stadium and um, for some reason they they didn't let the public in there there was sort of some security or something so to be honest 
it was quite special because I was running into the stadium and the old stadium's got marble steps, more of a chariot sort of shape, so it's not oval like a lot of the stadiums now. It was it's more long straights and tight bends. And I ran in there, crossed the finish line, and I felt like I was in the home of marathon running. So to finish there and have such a, a high run was, was a really special personal memory. Well, I mean, a podium in the marathon at a World Athletics Championships, it's, uh, it's a, you know, it's a not too frequent occasion for, a, you know, the, the nation of Australia, is there? Obviously, there's been some, you know, forerunners, Di Costello and, uh, and, you know, but really outside of Deacon yourself, uh, has anyone podiomed in the marathon? Uh, Lisa. Lisa. In the, in the men's, sorry, in the men's, men's yeah. but obviously in the women's. In the women's yeah. and... Um, it's a good question. Not uh, not at Worlds, or obviously Rob won in '83. But I think um, other than that, at the actual World Championships, there there hasn't been. And then um, at Olympic Games, Rob and I are fifth of the highest male finishers. So yeah, yeah obviously not. That's right. Um, Making it more special all the time. Is it good to rep? It is. And remind myself that it was pretty good performance. And you don't get it's interesting. Retrospectively, I mean, at the time, I was focused. I was only a minute behind the winner, so, you know, I ran pretty well. And I remember, you know, you're concentrating so much in the race. It wasn't until I crossed the finish line that I suddenly thought, wow, you know, this is a, this is a pretty special moment, and I really enjoyed that moment. And, I, you know, I think we don't, we don't appreciate the moments as much. And I, I, because I'd been around for so long, I actually did. Once I crossed the finish line, I realised, gee, this is a pretty significant moment, so I'm going to really enjoy it. And I remember walking around, getting the Australian flag and carrying that around and that sort of stuff and really soaking up the atmosphere. And you mentioned there, you know, you, you felt old. You were 35 at the time for that, that podium finish. Uh, at that stage, was mid-30s deemed upon as, you know, you're getting a little bit towards the you know the twilight years of a professional marathon career or was that just your perception because you'd, you'd mm. been around you know achieving success really from the age of 20 you know right through mm. um was that sort of ex- not expected that you would feature so well of yourself yeah. or by others or oh but i think by everybody you know I'd, I'd probably i was in the best shape of my all of my pbs were in the early 90s and then i won a commonwealth games gold medal in 94 but that was off the back of you know a bronze and a silver so that was like the culmination in my career so and then 95 and 96 i was solid but i was dropping back to i wasn't i wasn't favorite i was finishing in the in the top 10 you know I think I was 6th at 7th at the Olympics and 8th at the World Championships or the other way around 6th I think in in Atlanta but so to actually then reverse so that trend was oh I'm slowly disappearing down the pack to to actually turn that around then at, at an older age and probably male marathon runners then I'm not sure if the same now but normally would peak between 28 and 32 so here we are you know three or four years out of that that was quite unusual as it turns out I think um, all of us um, Abel Anton Martin Fizz were first and second and they were all in our 30s they're all about the same age so it was one of those tough races that maturity you know mattered got out on the day yeah helped on the day yeah <clears throat> Monas um, <clears throat> I grew up <clears throat> running as a child I had a little bit of talent in the cross country you know you just gravitate to those things that you feel like you're kind of better at as a kid and Mm -hmm. um it was pre me discovering triathlon uh triathlon stole my heart in the 90s with the televised nationals you know this domestic series the two is blue and the st Mm -hmm. george and brad bevan and greg welsh and you know those characters yeah but pre the advent of triathlon in front of my eyes you were the gentleman that, as I went through primary school, Steve Monaghetti was it seemed to be everywhere, and, and I remember Steve. I think you'll laugh at this, going down our back road in Grafton, a little suburb outside of it called Junction Hill, and running down to the river and back, which was about a two or three k down and back track. And I would try and perfect the Steve Monaghetti elbows. Right, it's and not pretty, is it? <laughs> no, no, no. no. Well, one as I are, it must have at that stage in my young head thought, right, to run fast, you need to do this. Yeah. And so, one as uh, I ran with the carry angle of my elbows, like you've probably right through my uh, primary school years. So, Matt, I just wanted to recognise you right. <laughs> and say thanks for the uh, for the, the technique coaching tip back then. Yeah. I don't think it's a great technique, but I think um, certainly people see silhouettes of me or see me from a distance, and they know 
it's me. It's unmistakable so it's running form. Yeah. yeah. I think it's quite efficient. I, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I'd recommend I think in distance running you try and be as natural as you can. So I wouldn't change too much, but it seems to have worked out okay <laughs> for me. So <laughs> It worked out very well. Yeah. But uh, it's, I guess the point of me uh, acknowledging there was that you left such an impression and I guess there's some of the touch points yeah. that you would hear as you, you know, mm. as you continue to be an ambassador for the sport where people tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, did you know that you really you know your performance has inspired me there and you know you get that all the time yeah and i think you know a couple of things just on that brad is back then there wasn't as much social media not as much coverage of events so you know it would be the middle of the night sometimes that we would be doing an overseas marathon and i know so many people go oh you know i'm I'm really annoyed with you you know you i'm blaming you for having to get up in the middle of the (laughs) night to watch you and so we were but we were competitive you know deke and i you know we had high placings in world marathon so it was quite unusual and it was yeah. quite a restricted market so it wasn't like we have the choices we have now so so many people uh. want you know made an effort so they sacrificed getting up to see it to watch us run and lisa and you know to be so competitive in world marathons you know we don't it's there's such a spread now we you know we might get it occasionally but we don't get it as consistently as what we did then and and so i think that's been a real positive and then you know i i i had some success at the half marathon in the early 90s and back then nobody knew what a half marathon was you know and I remember when I I ran a world best broke the world record the first time the guy uh, I crossed the finish line the great north run in England and uh, the guy came up and the organizer said oh I think you might have broken the world record I said might well you know you you, either I have or I haven't he said well we don't actually know what it is we're just checking to find out what it is for the world half marathon record can you remember your finishing time Steve I ran 60 34 60 34 the great northern run yeah, yeah yeah and that was at the time it wasn't you know half marathons weren't as popular as as they are now and I, I look at that you know the generational change and having come through that era and now half marathons are probably the most popular event and recreational running's taken off and you know i feel to some degree you know hopefully i've had an impact on that and made a difference in that so it's you know that's one of the legacies you leave behind i love what i do i love running i'm still running out go to lots of events and to see so many people enjoying what we love you know that yeah. that buzz you get out of being involved in a in a, in a distance running event is, is fantastic to see oh mate what, what do you think made that golden era like what were the what were the probably the two or three ingredients that you think as you say you know mm-hmm. You know, Australian distance running, we've had our real highlights in the last few decades, obviously, you know, and we've had some years of less mm. highlights, you know, mm. building years, I guess you'd say. But, you know, it's a question that as a physiotherapist from the running patients I see often comes up in conversation, you know, why is it that some of these sub t- two ten times were run by the likes of, you know, Steve Monaghetti and Rob DiCostella mm. in those decades? And at the moment, we, we you know, we've got some incredible guys coming through but Mm. but, you know what do you think what are the differences what are the reasons there was such that golden period yeah I I certainly think that our club system really worked well and you know I grew up in Ballarat and we just had a pack of runners and uh, I know Deke did as well and Chris Wardlaw who ultimately coached me um, was training and he was sort of the leader of that pack so this this group effect and I really think if you have a, a group of runners who were enjoying what they're doing, uh, pretty relaxed in training. Like we didn't train super hard, not as, nowhere near as hard as what people are training now. Training now, we didn't have the intensity. We just turned up. It was a bit of a show, social occasion. We go for a bit of a run. And if you get a group of people who are training at that level, eventually you will just the cream will rise to the to the top. And I think really that happened. And it was running was more of a western culture thing so there wasn't a lot of african interest not a lot of money and you know people didn't have the time or or um incentive to focus on their running as much as we did so that rawness of distance running really helps australia we're very good at new sports so if there's a new new sport or new event that's coming into athletics or a new sport we'll be really good at it and then the rest of the world suddenly works out what's going on technology comes involved there's a bit of money so they professionalize it and we come back to the pack a bit but in a natural sense Australians we're just naturally gifted at at sport and I think running and distance running you know we're in the right era we came off the back of some you know New Zealand dominance some really good Clarkie and and those sort of middle distance guys and then uh, Pat Clohesse and his influence allowed us to move out to the marathon and only takes one or two and that you know the lead by example and for me obviously having Deke 
precede me, obviously allowed me the opportunities that he'd set up. Yeah, and I mean, you said we're good at, you know, you feel like Australians are good at um, new sports. Mm -hmm. What gives us that ability? Is it just the pioneering spirit? Yeah, I think we have a go. We're not scared, so we don't we don't limit ourselves. And we a lot of people will overthink it, whereas Australians just get it done. So they just go, oh, well, we'll have a go. You know, I, I think of <laughs> women's pole vault. I remember Emma George. You know, she she was world record holder. I could. I mean, I mean, there'd be a lot of countries in the world a female saying, oh, "I've got to, I've got to get over." You know. Four metres, five metres. No, no, that's not going to happen. They wouldn't even contemplate doing that. That's impossible. I can't do that. Whereas we just go, oh, yeah, I'll have a go. Probably no good at it, but I'll, 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 I'll might hurt myself, but I'll, I'll get out there and give it a go. That's, and I think that that's part of, you know, the part reason. Of DNA. It is, yeah. It's exactly. beautiful. I mean, you're sitting here, the gentleman I'm seeing at the moment, Steve, getting ready. He's a lives on the Gold Coast, lives near the beach, you know, out in the valley, but, you know, we're like a coastal uh, city here on the Gold Coast, and he's getting ready to go and tr- set the Greenland... Uh, uh, fastest crossing across Greenland with his son-in-law on some uh, some kites and things, and right. you know it's held by a Norwegian explorer who's an ice man, and he's like it's quite funny. Here's this, and he's previously set an Antarctic record for crossing, you know, the fastest crossing, and there's a guy from the beach, an Aussie guy, yeah. setting these Norwegian breaking Norwegian records. Yeah. So it's that spirit. We'll have a go. And it's that mentality, and it's great. You know, and that's what I love it. It's it. It is. It's our pioneering nature, and you know, I hope we never lose that. It's yeah. one of the one of the one of the things I love about Australians. We have a go but we're also we're pretty modest and understated in what we do so we we just get in and get it done we don't expect any any pats on the back or accolades <laughs> we just get in there and have a go it's good it's yeah. a good way to be yeah well mine is um growing up i in researching today i don't know if it's accurate or not i don't know if it's accurate mm-hmm. or not but what i read was that you were con- considered to be an okay runner in your very mm-hmm. very beginning but mm-hmm. soon progressed in your high school years to be doing well is yeah. that any any substance to that or you always knew from the get-go that you were naturally gifted uh i, I ran around a lot at home just got up sure just because i could i was the youngest of four kids and i was you know i don't know i was always a pretty active kid i would i would play basketball i remember my mum would knock on the window telling me to come in for dinner because i'd be outside shooting just by myself for an hour or i'd play table tennis on the kitchen table and mum would have to say no it's that's it, it's time to go to bed you know so i was always Probably, I don't know, I seem to have a bit of uh, ability to just be in my in the zone doing my own thing and quite enjoying that. But And I'd run around at home, but I didn't ever think I'd be any good, obviously. And um, I wasn't that good. I wasn't the best runner in Ballarat for the first few years I was running. I'd just run along with a few guys. And, and as there's no doubt that I had a capacity to run distance without any trouble. So I'd, you'd beat me but I, I didn't seem to be worn out. So, you know, the distance wasn't long enough. So we'd run together and I'd be sort of running along and then you'd run over top me in the last bit and, and I probably could have gone, you know, I'd be sitting there thinking, well, if we had have gone a bit longer, I'd, I'd be fine. Yeah. But we never did. And then as the distances got longer, I say to people, I didn't actually get any better. Just as the distances got longer, I found myself in front of people who couldn't run that <laughs> distance. So I just ended up sort of heading towards the top and it was a slow burn, no doubt about yeah. it. I was the guy, you know, I... I, I won a Ballarat race at 17. I won a Victorian country title at right. 17 and a half and then a Victorian title at 18 and national title at 19, cross country, not even on the track. And I was third on the track. And then I went overseas and won my first you know, track race in Korea. And, and so it was a really slow... I was never the person that people would identify as being the winner. I was always... And I, I finished third so often, Brad, that I used to go to bed at night thinking I am a perennial place getter wow. and gee one day if i just hang in there one day i might actually win a race wow. and then obviously you know as it turns out you know i i, I won a lot in the oh, end but yeah. i didn't ever anticipate that that would be the case and at the end of the day and uh, it's one of the reasons you know i'm still running at the the, uh, the amount that i do now i just love running and the fact that i would run and be challenge myself and that put me up the front of the race was was irrelevant. I just wanted to run as fast as I could. And if you notice, over a lot of my career, I didn't just win races. I won by a long way in events. So I wouldn't just run along and go, well, Brad, I just, oh, I'm going to win today, so I'll just yeah. win in the easiest way possible. Yeah. It wasn't about that. Yeah. You know, I just ran hard. And if people ran with me, and I, I never actually had a problem with, if we ran and you beat, I ran hard, we ran hard and you won. I didn't ever have a problem with that because I ran hard, you ran hard, and you crossed the line first. That's fine. <laughs> so so, simple. Yeah, I, I don't find it. No, no, no. I like that competitive nature. You know, I did want to win, but yeah. I never, I never. Once we stepped off the track, I'd go, well, gee, if I've had a good day and a good run, and someone's beaten me, well, you just respect that and get on with it. 
So, Steve, what is it that you, because, you know, as you just identified, you are still running, you know, good miles, you know, in your, your current day. Uh, what is it about running? You said you love running, and I think it's pretty quick and easy for me to move off that statement and go, of course you do. You're Steve Monaghetti. Yeah. But what is it about, if you could boil it down, what are the two or three things you love most about running? Well, the social side of it, so catching up with my mates. So I, um, And even when I'm injured or old, I still get on the bike and try and ride beside them. I don't ride the bike to ride. I ride the bike to stay, you know, chatting with the guys and being involved in the, in the training regime. So that's certainly a factor. I feel very comfortable when I run. So for me, you know, there's not many places in life. Life's busy and, you know, if, if you find a place where... It seems natural and, and you're comfortable, then that's a pretty special place. Now, if I'm having a bad day and I throw my runners on and go for a run out in the bush, it, suddenly my world relaxes and I, I feel very comfortable. My mind's a lot more at ease and, and it, it seems to be... It's it's my natural state. So to find that and to keep, to keep using that, and that's, you know, what I really enjoy. So I feel like, and I know it's a, it's a sort of a cliche line of Bruce Springsteen, like, you know, that I was born to run. Mm. And I just think I, it took me a little while. I didn't start running until I was 14. But when I did it, it came fairly naturally. And it was almost like a light bulb. Oh, I've been doing this, you know, even though I haven't been running, I knew in my mind that this was where I was going to go. And so for me now, I don't, I don't think of it as hard work going for a run. It's just what I do. Yeah. You know, and what do I say to people? Oh, is running an important part of your life? No, it is my life. And it's a lovely position to be in where... I don't, I don't think of it as anything else but just, you know, in my DNA and something that I, I will do and hopefully if my body physically holds up, I'll, I'll continue to do because I, I feel very comfortable and natural and, and, and really enjoy it. And to find that passion, we've all got one, it's yeah. just, and I've been lucky to find it and to be able to continue to do it at a level that gives me great satisfaction. Mon, there's two questions there. Was there anyone that came along and tapped you on the back through your formative years to let you know that, you know, you've got the talent, you can make a career out of this. And secondly, was there a moment in your head where the light switched, the bulbs, whatever, the flick switched yeah. and the belief in you was just there, with galvanised, we like, I, I am... Hmm. I, I am. I belong on the international running scene. Like so, two hmm. things. Was there anyone that came along and? Really yeah, probably. Encouraged? I mean, I was. I was running at a club in Ballarat, but I. You know, we were sort of going training as a group. But Tony Benson uh, was my year nine uh, teacher at St Pat's in Ballarat, and he saw that I. He recognised I, I, we'd done a phys ed class and I ran pretty well and the time was on the blackboard and he said, oh, would you like me to set out some training with you for you? So he obviously saw some ability in the time. So he actually formalised my running. So I went from just going running with a few mates to actually having a formalised program. So yeah. that was his trust and his faith in me that, yeah. that I had some ability that was worth pursuing. That was good. Yeah. And then um, I think there was a race and, uh, you know, I've only ever had two coaches, Chris Wardlaw was the second one, so Tony Benson and Chris Wardlaw, and Chris, he'll be my coach forever, that's our relationship, and and I remember um, running a race at Gels Park in Melbourne, and, and I was, I think I was, I must have just turned um, 17, so, but they didn't have an under 19 or under 20 race, they had an under 17 race, but because I turned 17, I had to run in the open race, and I think it was 10 miles, 16k, and we, I'd only been running sort of 7 or 8k races, and uh, I got in this race, and I remember running against the big boy, so it was an open race, and I, I finished 6th or 7th, and I, and there's all these old blokes thinking, who's this kid running beside me, and suddenly <laughs> I realised this extra distance was actually going to work in my favour, and I couldn't wait to get out of junior ranks, so the distance has got bigger, wow. because I I actually thought, hey, this is where I'm at. So yeah. this is all fun, all this junior stuff. But once I get out with the big boys, I'm going to really be in my element here. So that was a light bulb moment for me, realising that I was going to be pretty competitive over long the distances in open ranks. And that's often a fear of people. They want to run age group stuff. And, you know, I have lots of parents and kids talk to me about age group stuff. At the end of the day, it's the open stuff that counts, you know. And whilst, whilst you can measure your age group, Open running is where, you know, obviously world records and, and you know, you're in an environment where it, it is, it's open for a reason. And whilst you can still break down the divisions, I love the, the openness. It's everybody, yeah. you know. And when, when I talk about that, yeah. um, the world marathon, the, the world record that I ran... You know, for me, I could have done, I could have won the race in a in a junior time, or I could have won the senior masters or whatever. What I did was, I, I won that race, and I 
and I ran faster for a half marathon than anyone in the history of the world. Yeah. Now that's an open event, yeah. so that's everybody. That's yeah. not. That's not. I didn't have to. There's no but in brackets afterwards. Yes, but you were doing this, but this was an age group, but you were junior. No, <laughs> it's everyone. Absolute. It is absolute. That's yeah. a great word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, you mentioned that, and I. I I get that, and no, by no means put in my running in, in the Steve Monaghetti category. But if I ever take to a start line, just for my own, outside of running with a patient or something like that, or someone that I'm supporting, I can't help but just give everything I've got mm. to to get to that finish line. And having emptied the tank, you touched on that before. You've always taken the line, and it's irrespective of whether you're first there or second or third or wherever in the top ten, you've just emptied the tank. Yep. What is it that fuels you to empty the tank? Is it the satisfaction you get, or is it the is it the competitive, competitive with yourself, competitive with others? What would be the yeah. driver? Because I've spoken to athletes, Stephen, I know you yeah. with, that sometimes find that to be a struggle to yeah. empty the tank. And I think that's a little bit. Yeah, I reckon you're born that way, and you know, I've always been a person who you know really likes that not the competitive nature but loves the challenge of a race so I can in training you know sometimes I'd switch it on in training but generally training was just for training sake but once I was on the start line and there was a gun and and, and you're off I've, I very much got into a different mindset of of the challenge of of seeing what I could personally deliver Mm. And that was always an interesting outcome because it's it's sort of the dichotomy of I know what I was going to run because all my training points to this. No, no, I'm in a race situation now, so I'm going to prove that wrong. I'm going to do better than the pundits would say. And I think if, you know, if people who know me would say I never had two bad races in a row. So one bad mm. race, I might tweak things and not quite get things right but by damn goodness the next race look out because yeah. <laughs> I was fired up so I, I really learnt from that and, and took that and I had a real pride in my performance so there was a, a challenge for me to make sure that every time I got on the start line that it was an opportunity and an opportunity that I was going to take and make best use of and I, I tell you, you know, I don't, I don't mean to go off on a tangent but I think a lot of people will um, talk about what they've done or, or in training and leading up and they'll talk about what the outcome's going to be, what they're dreaming of doing. One good thing about being on the start line of a race is it's the now mm. and you're in the now. Mm. So, you know, you're not running along. The gun goes and we start. Mm. So we start a marathon and we get 5K in. So no, you can't think about I, I don't turn to you and go, oh, look, in training last week I was a lot better than you so I don't know why you're bothering running with me because I'm going to – we don't do that. Mm. And then we don't go – why are you running with me, Brad? Because at the end of this race, I'm going to be two minutes ahead of you. We don't think like that. Because it's right now. It's the here and now. Yeah. And in marathon running, that's all you can deal with. And I reckon sometimes in life, people either tell you about what they've done or they say what they're going to do and they forget to live in the moment and just deliver right now. And running allows you... That running's a very good forum for doing that. And like I say to people... If you turn up on the start, say, say, you know, you've got a tight hamstring or you've been crook, you turn up on the start line, you've got your race number on, doesn't have in brackets, oh, yes, but I've been crook this week, oh, excuse me, I've got a little bit of a hammy twinge. If you're on the start line, we are all, all yeah. equal. Yeah. The gun goes... Everyone can win once, and that's the other thing I tell people is yeah. while when we're on the start line, yeah. everyone should think that they can win because yeah. they can because there's, there's no reason why you can't because yep. we're all there equal, we're all running the same distance yep. and as I say, the outcome is what it will be but at that point in time, yep. you think I'm here and now I'm in the position that I can win when the gun goes then you, you practice, you know, you put into place your plan and you live in the moment a lot more and then once you cross the finish line then you can be retrospective, do what you like but when you're running, you know, just, just be in the moment That's a powerful uh, insight, Steve, it really is because there's very few times in today's age where we're either thinking about the schedule <laughs> Well, you know that we're not not it's, it's difficult to capture the moment isn't it, and it I is. think running I certainly enjoy that and mm. you mentioned that it sort of brings that to my for my mind that yeah. it's something I enjoy about you can't be running along and you can be lost in thought but you've still got to be in, as for racing I mean you're racing your, your head's in the game yeah. <laughs> yeah the other thing interesting I haven't I don't I'm just I'm thinking I'm sort of taking that to, to another level a lot of times in, in a business sense we're working for someone else or in a workplace or um, with consequences, with deadlines we've got to meet. When you're running, it's just you and you're in control. 
of the situation. So I, that's that's quite unique to to a running event or a walking event or even a triathlon. You're actually in control. So no one's telling you what to do, or you know, you really can can. And I think that's not a bad space to be in. So you, it's probably something that gives people an opportunity to to be intrinsic and be be comfortable in their own skin, not answerable to other people. Yeah, beautiful, Steve. On the the way, I mean, I collected you tonight and brought you to record the interview here. But you mentioned we shared around uh, your recollection of Deke winning the 82 Com Games gold medal in the marathon um, and you shared with me that you were a 20 year old watching that on TV and fast forward five, four years you were off to Edinburgh mm. uh, for the 86 Commonwealth Games and you were there for the 10,000 metres that's right but then there was a bit of a you know unusual occurrence where you all of a sudden were there also for the marathon mm. so can you share a little bit about that what it was like to I think did you say you were rooming with Deke or you, yeah, were, yeah, you were rooming with Deke Costello yeah. what, what was that like incredible I don't even even really know how this all turned inspired but you know obviously I was having breakfast when he won in Brisbane and you know I suppose I was a budding distance runner with ambitions to go out to the marathon so it was obviously I was watching I was interested and and idolized Deke and you know in that interim of four years I went from being this kid just out of junior ranks to making the 10k team for Edinburgh and I never ever thought I would make a a, a championship track team because I've never been great on the track. So mm. for me, the, the hardest challenge was qualifying for the 10K and I only, I only just snuck under the qualifying time. And um, my coach, Chris Wardlaw, as well as being a, the world's best marathon coach, is a very wise man. And he saw the team only had two men uh, listed for the marathon. He knew we knew we could have three. And he said, oh, look, I'll talk to Athletics Australia if you like and see if we can get you running the marathon. We didn't need to have a qualifying time then, so it was quite a unique set of circumstances. And I'd run the 10K, finished fifth on the Saturday night, and the Friday morning was the marathon and, and turned up and ran along and worked out pretty well in the end. But... Um, it worked out well as a humility. You picked up a bronze. I did, yeah, surprisingly. <laughs> and it didn't seem that hard running marathons when you just turn up and run 2.11 and win a bronze medal at the Commonwealth Games in your first time out. But I think having Deke there was, was again, I room, as I say, I room, I'm not sure who decided we'd room together, but obviously that was a, you know, a great moment for me to be rooming. You know, I was pinching myself thinking, God, here's the, here's the defending champion, the person I've idolised. And to learn from the way he treated the media, his preparation, and I'm sure that rubbed off on me and made me a lot more relaxed. You know, he won that day. Lisa won the, the women's event, so it was a pretty pretty good day for pretty a dynamic distance day for us, yeah. yeah and I was kind of just in a part of that so to me whilst I was obviously it was a surprise for me and everybody it because Deke and Lisa were so successful it wasn't that unusual you know they were just doing the business and I just kind of was the the afterthought and I thought well if I can just keep going along here it's a little bit of a bonus for for me and my country and that's that's how it turned out it was a good bonus it was a nice S- bonus Steve uh, and then one of the questions that's come through from the listeners is you know you have managed to recreate yourself you've gone from the bronze medal in the you know Edinburgh 86 com games to the silver medal in uh, 90 uh, it, I think Auckland that's right yep. and then 94 the gold in the marathon mm. what's the mindset like each four year cycle to take to the start line and you know know that you expect more from yourself and you know what's the psychology like on that I actually think it's you know it's a good challenge because you know I had unfinished business so that was motivation for me I was beaten by well, certainly, I mean, I finished third in that first race in Edinburgh and Dave Edge was second and I, um, Canadian guy, English guy who, oh, sorry, Canadian who was living in England, so he was almost a local and, and we had a close battle, so I, I could have almost got silver. We were together just outside the stadium. So imagine I, you know, I had a silver there beaten by Deke Four years later, I was beaten by Douglas Wakahuri in Auckland, who was one of the great marathon runners of that era. You know, yeah. Olympic, world champion from 87, um, silver medalist from 88 in Seoul and one London marathon. And, and so um, to be beaten by... And we ran 210 on the foreshore of Auckland in a humid, hot day. So I, I think that's one of, one, <laughs> wow. of my, one of my better runs. But because I was second, you know, everyone thinks, oh, well, you didn't win. But uh, And then by... Certainly by 94, I was the best runner in that race on the day. Yeah. So all I had to do was execute. I didn't have to do any... I didn't have to beat a superstar. I didn't have to run above myself. Expectations were that I was the best runner. It was a cool day. 
I was wearing sunglasses, but that's another story. But um, and it just all fell into place. I mean, I ran. I think we were Pat Carroll. I think we we went through Sean Cool. We went through halfway in about sixty seven minutes. So I ran two eleven forty eight. So I back ended in sixty four forty or something in a championship. You know, in um, in on. Uh, uh, Vancouver Island, Victoria. So it was a pretty good. Yeah, no one was going to beat me that day. I mean, you're running 64 and a half in the second half of a championship marathon. Wow. You're going to win most of them. Wow, um, that's impressive. Negative split. Yeah, yeah. well, truly by well, three minutes. Yeah, wow, good K. Stephen, that year you went on to win Tokyo. That's right. Yep. Yeah, well, early in the year. So that sorry, was um, early in the year. That was in February and. Uh, that was uh, so. I ran just under two nine there, I think, as well. And that was they were always going to call that race off because it was it had been snowing in the the days leading in, and they had to uh, get um, um, salt put it on the road to melt the snow so that it, the roads were runnable. So it was almost cold. It was that cold. Wow. It was, I think it was two degrees when we started and pretty chilly day. But um, L- yeah, like you had your training base in Ballarat. In Ballarat, that's right. <laughs> that's what everyone says. Yeah. Exactly. And then uh, obviously another world major in Berlin in 1990. Yes. Um, and so you know that's an incredible success for Aussie running. Um, mm. You know, as a dignitary of that event, I know you still feature and go back and lead mm. tours and different things. That must be incredible. But you incredibly rewarding to head back and relive that experience yeah it was that was i had one marathon i don't think that was the first one i won if i'm thinking right yeah that's right and um so there's a bit of pre- again you know coming back to that history of having always been a perennial placer and i think that was my sixth marathon so and i was going i think i was going backwards initially i was third fourth fifth at the olympics then second at um uh London Marathon in 89 and then second at Commonwealth Games in 1990. Actually, not too bad when you think about they're my first six marathons that I won in Berlin and, <laughs> yeah. and that, I ran the fastest time in the world that year because I know Gillian Doe bought in and ran, I think he'd ran 2.818 or something and I was I was pretty keen on getting that so sneaking under that time. And at the time, Brad, it was the 13th fastest marathon in history. Wow. I mean, you look at it now, they'd run 13 in a week two hours eight minutes now they'd, there'd be 13 runners run under that in a week probably they'll do that on the weekend in some marathon around the world but back then that was you know i was only a minute just over a minute and a half off the world record talking about you know the evolution of the marathon world record mm-hmm. coming down and as you noted there berlin shifted over the years you know and uh what do you think's responsible for that shift steve over the decades mm-hmm. oh, i think uh, you know the financial rewards i mean uh, you know i got i got paid pretty well i, I want to Mercedes Benz all seem pretty good to me, but now the incentives and the Africans have learned how to run. I used to say that, and it's 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 not a, it's not a not a um, indictment on the Africans, but they used to do their two and a half hour run in two hours. That was their problem. They were too fast, mm. so they try and get it done. They'd go, we don't have to run marathons. We don't have to be patient. We're good over the shorter stuff. And then they suddenly realise, hey, we can make a good living out of this if we're patient and do the long running and you know they they, they certainly revolutionized mm. the marathon running and, and berlin i think there's more when we were running we wanted to run fast but it was more about racing and now i think this generation it's uh, there's a lot of paced races and it's it's really set on times yeah. and I, I i kind of you know obviously they're running quicker than me i can say this i, I i'm a little bit disappointed that there's less um just upfront racing because yep. that's you know at the end of the day i love it's it's man oh man you know woman against woman it's human racing yep. i don't worry about the time the, the first and the ultimate thing is the competitive nature of marathon running it's a very long way to run yep. the you see it in people's faces the the tactics that are played out it's just it, it's just a fascinating look into the human psyche yep. now if, you, if it's all paced and all set up and you're not seeing a person till the last 5k when they take off i think you lose a little bit of that human element and it it's almost become more about times rather than the purity of, of racing against each other and i mean obviously that leads us into the you know current attempt for the sub two hour with you know the nike project the two hour project and obviously you're a long-term nike uh, athlete and you know close to the brand and yep. um you know uh where, how do you see them coming in on that one do you reckon it's uh i mean what two questions do you see it being done in the new in this year, we're in the new year already, 28, 2017, or do you 
you know, see it being done in three decades, or do you not see it being done? So well, I thought it'd probably take about ten or twelve years, but obviously the way they're going looks like that. When Kipchoge can, I'm sure he can break the world record. Bikili, I think you need that track speed, and Kipchoge and Bikili have come from successful track careers, so they're fast enough. And it's just a matter of it being able to absorb the training at a high level. So, and if the conditions, obviously the Nike. Program is going to set it up perfectly, so you know around a, a controlled circuit, conditions will be good, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, I, I certainly think they'll go close to two hours. Um, it's it's in a false environment to some degree, and and I want to see it in a real race, as, as you probably got from from the way I've responded. But what it will do is raise people's sights. So there's no doubt, you know, in Ballarat, we, we've got a great culture of distance running, but some of the guys I was training with, we had a fantastic training group, and it's the strongest Ballarat's ever been when I was running at my best because people get caught up with you. They just they just come along for the ride, and suddenly their, their, um, their, you know, their mindset's different. Expecto- they think, well, I'm honest, he's just, I'm just a normal bloke who trains hard and gets success <laughs> and goes to this level, and suddenly they were coming along with me, and we, were, we rode a wave where we were just, we were probably the best club in Australia at the time. It wasn't just everyone says, oh, that's because you were running with them. No, no, no. We had five or six guys that were really at the top of their game. Yep. And without me, they would have still been that we would have been the strongest club in Australia. And that's phenomenal to think like that. So what this will do is it will bring the marathon record. We'll get under two hours closer yep. officially because of it. So I think it's a great thing. It's yep. a bit one of those, you know, the barriers we love. We love to set barriers. Well, well, this is going to, you know, Pink Floyd that we're going to break through the wall. Right? It's on the wall. I love my love my music, and it's a good uh, metaphor for what's going to happen in the marathon running world. Who are your favourite artists? Just a little side note there, Steve. Well, I kind of like my um, alternative music, so I'm a, I'm a Joy Division fan from the late '80s. So I like um, yeah, Radiohead, Joy Division, as you know, Pink Floyd, a bit of that, and a bit of alternative music. So yeah, Smashing Pumpkins in the day. I remember going and seeing Smashing Pumpkins live, and I think everyone thought I was there with my kids or so. They couldn't believe I was actually, I was the oldest person in the in the room. Yeah, so I love that. And, yeah, it's good. It's a nice um, nice break from my running and yeah. the public perception of me, the runner, and then to be able to have yeah. my other side of my life. I love my music. I saw so. a picture of you with a guitar. I didn't know. Do you play? Or was no, that, no. That was a, I'd that was love a, to. It was a, a prop. That was a prop. Yeah. <laughs> that was a prop. But you, you, uh, could have, you could have answered that differently, you yeah, yeah. Mate, um... We've spoken about the highlights of your career. This program is very much also about getting into the, the tougher times for athletes and physical performers mm-hmm. and helping people connect with the fact that we see the success, but there's also a whole lot of you know, groundwork and pain at times. Yeah. Was there ever a time in your career, Steve, where your commitment wavered and, and you didn't know if there was a way forwards? Uh, that's, to some degree, and it's talking about... Um, probably talking about... I'm fine, mate. Talking about... Um, Setbacks, and you know, I had I, I was at a stage in my career, I, I was sort of cruising along, and I, I just got out of um, junior ranks and I ran a world cross country and uh, didn't run very well. And it was, I was just sort of, I was flatlining a little bit. And uh, I, I was on a, a mate of mine was a pole vaulter, and he was doing some gym work, and I was on a trampoline, and I, I um, had a, a I lost my spatial awareness, and I landed on the trampoline and um, fractured the C6 vertebra in my neck. So I you know, sort of broke my neck, but no, um, no effect on the spine. Yeah. But I had a little bit of paralysis down one side of my arm, and went off in the ambulance to hospital. And I was in hospital for a couple of weeks, and then couldn't run for obviously for three or four months. I had the neck brace, and and at that time, so that was a pretty critical thing mm-hmm. for me. And I was, I remember lying in my hospital bed thinking, if I ever actually get back running, mm-hmm. I'm not going to take this for granted. I'm going to really make sure I appreciate this mm-hmm. ability that I've been giving. It was a real turning point wow. in my life. I came out of there. So that was um, 13th of Wednesday, the 13th of June, 1984. And I remember I got back running sort of at the Jeez. back end of that year. And I ran the World Cross Country Trial, made the World Cross Country team in 1985, so I went to, yeah. uh, didn't run very well over there, but went to Lisbon in Portugal, and then 1986 Commonwealth. And so, it, you know, I came back from that, and my career just went in a really positive direction. So uh, it was a life lesson for me, and, you know, if, if, if there's a lesson out of it, it's, you know, we sometimes take our potential and our ability for granted mm. and you still got to work hard so it's, it's good enough it's not good enough having talent it's then making sure that talent gets realized so yeah. it's the steps the work ethic and that's what i probably got to the stage where i'm thinking oh i'm pretty good at this it's just going to come naturally and when i suddenly had that 
kick in the bum, mm. you know, got me to get out and say, hey, I've got to work really hard to go to the next level, and that's yeah. exactly what I did. Um, so that and then Barcelona, you know, I, I, I ran 22 marathons, and I think I finished in the top uh, 11 or higher in 20 of them. And one one of the other ones, I was injured, but ran it to get a qualifying time for, for Sydney. So it worked out well. Seville, the world championship. So I finished about 24th, but qualified me for the team for Sydney or got me uh, into the place. I still had to run the time. but So I ran that um, for, for obvious reasons. So the only real bad marathon I had was Barcelona at the Olympics in 1992. Bad one to have. I mean, you had the Olympics, but... I really, you know, I could have easily just said, well, that's it, I'm never going to be any good, you know, I'd already won a few um, medals and international events and world records and stuff, but, and, and I was at a position in my life where I could have just given it all away and said, that's it, but I, I was prepared to take that on, bird, on board, learn from it, we made a few mistakes in that preparation that I never did again, the depletion diet, staying in a non-air conditioned environment just out of um, Barcelona a place called San Cugat training hard and there were some signs there so I learned from that used the heat chamber in Ballarat post that and again you know that Athens run in 1997 where I, I ran so well in hot weather at a major championship was vindication that I learnt from yeah. that. I didn't just chuck it in and give it away. I said, no, I'll take that on board. It was a very disappointing result. I was yeah. embarrassed about letting down Australia at the Olympic Games, but rather than get get down about it, I said, oh, well, we're going to move on and prove people wrong and learn from it, and I did. And reinvent it. And I, there's that adage, I just love it. I've said it before on the program, experience isn't necessarily the best teacher, but evaluated experience really is. That's, that's and, right. Uh, yeah, exactly. and, and you mentioned the depletion diet. What was your learning from... From, uh, from from that, that. well, I, and I I did it in because I was uh, I was already dehydrated from the hot weather, yeah. so my body was already in a dehydrated s- spot. So then doing the depletion and really um, um, depleting my glycogen stores, I got very tired. And rather than and normally you do that to trick your body into um, producing glycogen, but I think I'd been so dehydrated and so, got so low in glycogen, my body gave up and said, we're going to die, we're just going into protection mode. Yeah. And it didn't produce any glycogen, sort of just closed down. So I just, I, I'm probably so obsessive, I did the diet so well. Yeah. And my prep, and I'm thinking, this is all great. I got down to about 57 kilos. I was very thin and very skinny, and I'm thinking, how good is this? But in hindsight, there was a sign there yeah. that I was I was really depleted and, and um, underdone, and it came back to, to haunt me. Obviously, I got halfway through that marathon, realised I was I just wasn't going to bounce back, yeah. drop back through the field, and battled on to the finish. Oh, that's a you know for any marathoners out there, we have all most of us experienced that finish. <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, you know whether you're uh, two hours or four hours or whatever, it's uh, it's a long way to the finish line once it's it's. it's hit in hasn't it it is and that's the thing I often feel some empathy now and I don't want to say you know that I I understand what a four or five hour marathon runner goes through but I think sometimes that their prep I was a professional full time athlete I prepared meticulously Mm. and most of my runs reflected that on I sometimes think that life's busy for a lot of people and they don't probably commit to the mm. to the marathon training that you need because 42K is a very long way to run, so you probably need to be running 40K runs, you know, regularly. And, and because they're not doing that, it's highly likely that they will run out of glycogen and hit the wall, you know, and, mm. and they're battling home. They, they're battling home a lot, a lot more difficult, having a lot more difficulty finishing than I ever was because I'm out there for two hours, I'm highly trained, my body's in mm. great shape, it's ready for it. For someone to take on the challenge of running a marathon knowing that the last 10K is going to be brutal, yep. uh, you've got to admire people for doing yeah. that. And, you know, as I say, I don't have the real empathy, but I have, I have a, a little snippet of it of where it happened to me, yeah. so it gave me a greater appreciation for how tough it is for normal people to run a marathon and run it out when their preparation isn't as professional and as meticulous as mine was. And, I mean, you know, there's the ability to have coaching through Train by Champs and mm-hmm. obviously you've got runners all over the probably the landscape that uh, that benefit from your insights and, and learnings over your years, Steve, racing professionally. Is there one story of anyone you've coached that really stands out as going from, 
you know, metamorphosis from runner here to runner there. Any significant sort of coaching um, successes you've had, Steve? Yeah, Troopy, you know, obviously Lee Troop moved to Ballarat to run with me and um, and he really improved. I, I improved having him there because he raised, he, he was he was running faster than me over shorter stuff. So he made me just, rather than in the, in the back end of my career, probably drop away in the intensity of training, my training actually picked up. And, I, and you know, I've got to thank him for a lot of my performances. But interestingly, when and uh, I'm not sure if I was technically coaching him, but basically we trained together, and you know I, I chatted to him, and he did everything I did, and I gave him a lot of feedback on his on his um, how he was running, and we, he wanted to run the marathon. That's why you know we were talking, and and interestingly he did he was doing marathon training. And he ran 7.41 just outside the Australian record for 3K and broke Ron Clark's, whatever it was, 33-year-old record for the 5K. And yet that was off marathon training. Oh, and it wow. was a complete surprise to us. We could not believe it. So I, we got a lesson of how strong you become mm. from my training. So the training, not my training, sort of the Paco SED Yep. Chris Wardlaw philosophy of training makes you super strong and then it's the tweaks at the top end so I can get you strong and then you can do what you like to, to really maximise your performance and that was a classic example of that we're all we're worried about is getting Troopy to run under 210 for a marathon <laughs> and he, he blitzed 3k Three and 5k it was yeah. phenomenal wow. it shows that strength yeah. can, can make you fast as well oh, isn't that a good le- lesson let's talk about a performance around here Steve slight like shifting gears some sort of rapid fire questions <laughs> for you the first the training session you most dislike? Uh, Gamudis. <laughs> What's that? So that's where you um, you run pace, so you do a couple of laps in, in 70, couple, sorry, a couple of laps in 80, a couple of laps in 70, and then a couple of laps flat out, and you sort of walk, jog a lap, and do two or three sets of that, and um, that was hard, Painful. really hard. Session you most love, Monitz? Uh, favourite session uh, my fart leg session was, was always something I felt I dominated and, and, and ran and uh, it's hard but it's um, you know something that I obviously become renowned for but I really I think it, it just it fitted my, my DNA pretty well and it, it suited my training and I could control it, and it's nice to think that you know a few other people are enjoying it as well. well mate, I'm going to give you a handshake here. No one can see this, but I'm shaking Mona's hand because, mate, when I got back into my phase two of running after my junior triathlon years, the Monaghetti fartlek was our Thursday morning staple here on the Gold Coast with Peter Hall and the Nike yeah. Three Crew. And, mate, it's still going. So, mate, you've set up an institution. Thank you. And people feel bad about it. Sometimes they go, oh, I add a few. You know, I do, I do four by, you know, 90. Or, and I don't mind because if they're doing fartlek and they're enjoying their running, then they don't have to apologise for it. I'm just delighted that they'll attribute it to, you know, to back Mon- to me. Monaghetti fartlek, it's, it's ingrained in their running culture. Favourite pre-race meal? Moderns over the years, maybe even now with uh, racing. Definitely. I remember before the Great North Run, uh, I had a massive bowl of um, spaghetti with uh, so Napolitano, so um, tomato sauce and a, a, a apple pie, apple crumble <laughs> dessert. And I, I ran a world record the next day, so you got to think that was pretty good. So if you duplicate, have you, did you carry yeah. that, that that on? Or Doesn't you? work anymore, <laughs> <laughs> mate. Uh, you know, it, now and certainly through your, your professional career, were you were quite rigorous around bedtime and, and rise time, or was that a bit lax for you, like a bit more flexible? Or? Yeah, it, it was. It was locked in. It was. So it was I am. A, I am a creature. Man of, no, but man of, what do I say? I say I'm. Uh, I'm meticulous. What do my family and my friends say? I'm anal. <laughs> I don't think that's a compliment, Brad, but that's what they say, mate. Well, it's worked. And uh, so, what time would you normally try and? Be you know lights out and lights up. Oh yeah, ten thirty. Way. You know, and pr- pretty much up at seven o'clock. So yep. you know, and run. I run even now. We run. You know, most of our sessions, even though I'm not running as um, consistently. You know, we'd have thirteen minutes past five on a on a Tuesday night at the lake. You know, four thirty on a Wednesday night, eight thirty Sunday morning. So all these odd times, but yep. we just stick to it. And I've stuck. That was. The, where do you think that? Pattern. You know, you know, call it anal, you know, anal or whatever you want to label it. But mm-hmm. where do you think that? You know that discipline, that finite discipline, which some athletes have, some don't. Where do you think that comes from for, for you? Um, yeah, obviously from my parents. They, you know, they um, um, they didn't really have the opportunities I had, but they've always had a pretty. Um, my mum's pretty regimented. She likes her, um, her her way of doing things. So I think that 
you know, country yeah. country upbringing from my mum's probably where I got it from. I'll yeah. blame her. Oh, she, she's not listening, yeah, so I'll be is, right. This is Monteghetti. Mate, uh, who's the athlete you most admire and why? You know, and this is a tough question. You're the chief mm-hmm. demission for the 2018 mm-hmm. Com Games team. You've been the chief demission for 2010, I think it was, or 14. Mm-hmm. Um, 14? Yep, 10, 14. Yeah, 10, 14. Yep. You know, so it's not like, you know, you've got to answer carefully here, mm-hmm. Steve. Yeah, it's... Um, I'll, I'll sort of. I'll, I'll, it might be might be the the expected answer or something unusual. I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll say Craig Mottram because I never I never ran a race or trained with anyone who I didn't think I could beat them. So every time I turned up at a race, I always thought, mm-hmm. well, Brad, you might beat me, but also you might not. And we probably didn't quite cross when I was at my peak, but I can categorically say that. A couple of races I was on the start line with Craig Mottram. I had to, I will say publicly, may not have ever said this, I knew I couldn't beat him. Wow. So for me, that was the ultimate compliment to him because, you know, I would think that I'm a pretty good competitor and would never put myself in that position, but I had to admit that he was he was a better athlete than me. So in those races, I was I was running for second, which is, I don't, I'm not proud of saying that, but yeah. that's that's probably true. And, you know, to watch him, you know, I had some, some um, close associations with him along the way and to watch him develop how beautiful a runner he was. I remember the 2K Australian record he ran at Olympic Park was was just phenomenal to run. And then, you know, the Commonwealth Games 5K, yeah. he didn't even win. You know, run 12.56, you'd be thinking you're probably going to win. <laughs> he didn't win. So to, to watch him develop and see his range. And, you know, I'm so disappointed he didn't really get give himself the opportunity to run a good marathon because, you know, would have loved to have seen him... Um, Really, at his best, seeing what he could what he could do. And uh, Craig's, you know, been a former guest of the program, and certainly references some of the formative years with the Australian icons like yourself, bringing you know juniors through the ranks. So, mm. listeners, jump back, have a listen to mm. Craig's recollections. Uh, there was something about uh, some fun and games on uh, on a few of the training yeah. runs, which uh, <laughs> listeners, I'm not going to share. You're going to have to go no. back and listen. That's right. And just on that, Brad. Interestingly, the other <laughs> I, I would be remiss of me not to mention, and I, I was fortunate. I'd retired and. By I, I won't bore you with the story, but by by do bore us with the story. With the story. Well, I was coaching a lady who um, who was running the nationals in Melbourne. I'd retired. It was two thousand and three, I think. And anyway, she was running, so I was going down to watch her run. She's going pretty well, Ruth Barton. And and she said, "Oh, look, you know, you're still going. Okay, why don't why are you down there? Why don't you run?" And I thought, "Oh, okay, she's already ran." I thought, "Oh, maybe I will. I'll jump in and run." Anyway. Um, I ran. It was in Melbourne, so I didn't have to travel, and it wasn't a big deal. So I entered and turned up and ran, and um, as it turns out, I won the national title. So this is retired. I'm thinking, how is this happening? But anyway, I did. And I, I remember crossing the finish line, and um, someone someone came up and said, um, oh, look, you realise, you know, because you've won, you, you're automatically selected to go to the World Cross Country next year. And I said, oh, no, I don't, I don't want to go to the World Cross Country. And they said, oh, it's a shame, because we think we're going to have a pretty good, um, good team for Ireland. I said, Ireland? Oh, I love my Guinness, love my craft beers. Gee, maybe I will go to Ireland. I'll get be able to go to the Guinness factory. Anyway, um, as it turns out, so I decided I'd go, and they changed it because I think it was foot and mouth or some mad cow disease broke out or something. They changed it to Brussels, but I was committed. So I went anyway, and um, and I was kind of – I was older than the team manager, I think. But anyway, I went along, and it was great to be a part of the team and show them a bit of leadership and experience. And anyway, <laughs> um, obviously, I'm not sure if you know, but history would show the 2004 World Cross Country, Benita oh. Willis won. And I was standing, she ran past me with 20 metres ago, I was standing there with Nick Badeau, we were celebrating. I saw one of the greatest performances by an Australian distance runner ever. Whether we'll have another winner of, of the World Cross Country, maybe not in my lifetime. And I was there, and you think that it was Ruth Barton on one lazy day in Ballarat saying, hey, why don't you come down and have a run? And those events then conspired to me witnessing firsthand mm-hmm. Benita winning that memorable race. So, yeah. you know, I, I, when you say people who have influenced mm-hmm. me or, um, you know, runners that I respect and look up to, that run that day was, mm-hmm. it will never get the, the accolades that it deserves. I'm, I'm pumping it up here now, but to be there on that day was a was an unbelievable special day and you know so there's some of the opportunities I often think people forget about opportunities they kind of go oh I'm I'm lucky oh you know I'm never as lucky as you you make your own luck and there's a classic set of circumstances that all kind of 
conspired to me being in that position. If I had have said, it would have been easy. I had five or six opportunities to say no, no, no along that journey, yep. and I persisted, and the outcome was a, yep. a fantastic memory. Wow, wow. And, you know, for listeners, jump back over, listen to Benita Willis actually share around that historic world cross-country, mm-hmm. you know, run for Australia that, you know, Mon has just referenced. Incredible. <laughs> Mate, uh, you probably answered it around Craig Motcher, but the toughest competitor you've ever raced against. Um, yeah, I think, in, in, having said that, I, I don't, I'm not sure if... Craig was just unbelievably good. The toughest was definitely Deke mm. because I'm not sure if people realise, but if you go back and have a look at the footage, it's almost become um, a, a tradition now or, or um, not an antique but a classic because he ran he ran with strength and power mm. and no marathon runners now. The Africans are so light on their feet and, and so fluent. They don't actually run with pure aggression. Mm. Deke ran with pure aggression. I remember racing against him. I was just an up-and-coming kid but he knew, you know, he, he was trying to put me put me keep me keep me in his um in his uh, behind him and i remember him he, he, he sort of he didn't really he kind of just turned his head to look at me and just said right oh mate this is it and he just he, he just threw brute strength he just he just went ran away from me and there was nothing i could do about it and he he was he was bloody tough and yeah. don't ever deke's a lovely fellow you know we're, yeah. we're great mates now and he's got the perception of being a pretty um nice guy but he as a competitor he was tough really he was one i reckon he was the last of the real tough uh, distance runners and we've changed now and we've lost a lot of that real pure aggression and power and he was he was so good at that so he's probably the toughest competitor I've ever wow, had. That's, that's, that's incredible. Listen to jump back over, have a listen to Deke, you know, talk about his career. Um, Monas, is there a mantra that you've used consistently over your career uh, when you run? So, you know, is there anything that would often be a regularly played loop in terms of self-talk? Um, it, it, one, I, I kind of reminded myself that, and I tell people, there's nothing I've ever done in a race that I didn't do in training. Wow. So, what, and obviously not to the extent of I never ran 2, 8, 16 in a, in, and 42.2K in training, mm. but I did snippets of it. So I, I pushed myself so I, I saw what I could do in training. So when I turned up at the start line, it was almost um, expected of me what my performance would be. So I was never really surprised by my outcome because I knew I'd done the preparation to lead up to that. So I think preparation's the key. Mm. And I, I, I would be on the start line with people and I could I could tell that they were, you know, they were standing on the start line, you can't see listeners, with fingers crossed going, gee, I hope today's my lucky day. Well, I knew I had them beaten because I was on the start line going, today's not going to be a special day. Today's going to be the day I expect because two weeks ago in training, that's what I did. So today all I need to do is replicate that and I win, you know, so (laughs) it's a good result. So I wasn't wasn't in that position hoping that things were all going to conspire to get me to have a good day. I'd already done it. All the preparation had set it up that all I was doing was publicly executing what I'd done in training. And you've used that word a couple of times very much. That must have been, you know, your mentality of it's just a matter of executing well. Yeah. 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 Yeah, And I think that's my mindset's probably, you know, being a being a pretty meticulous, patient, you know, I'm not sure if I I don't know I I don't know if I'm academically intelligent, but I'm I'm intelligent in, in a in a in an unusual way of being able to read a situation pretty well and maximise the outcome from it and that, that served me really well to be able to know my, my physical preparation was good and then what steps I needed to do within the race situation to make sure that that preparation was reflected in my result. It's interesting you mentioned, you know, uh, I mean, in preparing for this evening, I read that Steve Monaghetti has a degree in civil engineering, a graduate diploma in education, and an honorary mm-hmm. doctorate from the University of Ballarat. So I don't know about your statement about academics there, Steve, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, well, I, I mean, another story, just to, no one would know this. So I, I was training with Shane Nan Curvis in Ballarat, who's a, a great mate, and he, he went to World Championships and Commonwealth Games, and, um, and he, he wanted, he had a sort of a career change and he wanted to do um, uh, a real estate course. And I said, oh, I love my real estate. Um, yeah, maybe we'll do it together. He said, oh, that'd be great because I've tried it, started it once and I didn't finish it. So it'd be good to have a mate doing it. So we did it together. So we, we started off and um, he got one assignment in and chucked it in and I finished it. So I actually did an agent's representative That's course as well. And I really enjoyed it. It was great to just to keep mentally um, stimulated. It was yeah. terrific. So I got that under my, although it's ran out now, so I might go back <laughs> well, and do that. Again. If you're in the Ballarat area and you want to list your property, come yeah, see Steve. I'm your man. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> You'll run fast. Um, Steve, but I think intelligence on many levels is obviously a varied thing, but it's a, it's a hallmark of 
great physical performance, not just once, but across a career. I think that and the character of the athlete, you can't sustain that talent without, I don't think, the character and also that intelligence to manage yourself and manage expectations. So mm. That's uh, true, Brad. That's a different, it's a different form of intelligence. Mm. I think we've false... You know, intelligence, we think, mm. diff- it's, 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 we've probably bastardised the word a little bit and your, your definition is, yeah, is a, a lot more on the spot, I reckon. athletically. Steve, uh, your best recovery tip? For listeners, gosh, gee, that's good. What the hell? I don't know. The hot shower was about all I ever had, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> it I worked. Tell you. Yeah, it worked. Yeah, yeah. Your worst injury over your years? Oh, I, my Achilles, definitely. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've had a couple of. Um, what are, I'm not allowed to call them. What do they call them? Um, not, I don't call them operations. Procedures, Procedures on my Achilles. So yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I've had a. Um, I had a, a bone shaved on my my right Achilles and then my left Achilles. So I put up with that. For, I actually ran at the Olympic Games in Sydney with uh, 23 mil heels in my shoes. They were so high that I had to actually get them in. I couldn't run. I couldn't just put a heel raise in the shoe. I had to go to a boot maker to put get an insertion put in the shoe just to get me through that race. So For both um, Achilles? Yeah, both Achilles. Because you yeah. have troubles. Exactly, yeah. I well, put up with it for a very long I think I, that was, I did it at the Commonwealth Games in 1998 when I won the bronze medal and wearing spikes on the track in negative yeah. plane and woke up the next morning, couldn't walk, and I spent 12 months sort of in rehab getting back. That's where that Seville run at the Worlds was. It seemed special. to be disappointing, but it was actually set me up for Sydney. And then to finish 10th after the prep I'd had the last couple of years and what I'd been through, you know, it's not about, I'm not, not sort of doom and gloom, but it was a pretty good result to finish yeah. 10th off the preparation I'd had. And you'd battled the tendons, Achilles tendons on and off the long time yeah, and then I you know I still so I didn't have the op on that right Achilles till 2012 so I'd, I'd had that for 14 years before I decided to get it up so yeah. I think I managed it pretty well I'm just I don't know am I an idiot or you're the you're the physio Brad you tell Ten, me that it, tendons, that's a long Steve, time tendons are a passion of mine in practice but they are I often say right from the get-go for a patient you know the good news is we can improve this and we can get there if we do the right things there's no bad news but it's going to take time take a while yeah, yeah. tendons are phenomenal lots yeah. of research being done on the moment one yeah. word to describe Steve Monaghetti's racing style um aggressive aggressive how would you describe being in the zone Oh, there, there's no doubt. And I tell this to people. I say, even everybody can do this. So I say, go, give yourself an hour. I don't mind if you walk, shuffle, jog, run, but I say, go for a run for an hour in a beautiful environment. 20 minutes to de-layer all the stress of life. 20 minutes where you are in the zone and it's like you're floating in a supernatural state. And it's an unbelievable feeling. You feel like you are floating when you're running and you, you have clarity of thought, no worries, very clear um, mindset. And then the last 20 minutes, you've got to bring yourself out of that state so you can re-enter normal society. So that's why I like the hour, 20, 20 and 20. The, the six, third, a third, a third principle. The 60 minutes. When was the last time, Steve, you are in the zone? Been a while now, let me tell you. I, I think um, I had a race about... Um, Oh, three months ago where I, I, hadn't, I hadn't been going very well and I, I ran on the track and I, I ran pretty well. And uh, I think I was 9.45. Oh, seriously, I should run about 12 minutes at the moment for 3K probably. And I ran 9.45, just calling in a bit of old form and I got off the track. <laughs> thinking, Geez, I got away form. with that one. Yeah, so <laughs> that was probably the last time on the track in Ballarat. Lamberis in, oh God, January, I reckon. Yeah, wow. Well, you, mate, you've experienced it recently. Steve, uh, changing gears, bit of fun stuff to finish off here. What's on the bucket list still? for Steve Monaghetti. I mean, in terms of your sporting bio, listeners heard it at the start, there's few careers that are as laden as yours, not only Mm. in the professional sense, but in the administrative representation, giving back to the sport, Mm. I mean, all these roles. Is there anything still on the sporting sporting bucket list? Oh, not really. You know, I think to, um, you know, I'd love to, I really need to, it's a reverse answer, to be honest, Brad, because I've achieved so much personally that's now uh, I'm trying to remove a bit of the expectation mm. and go to events and be less worried about my result and try and enjoy the event and the camaraderie and helping other people. So it's going out of my personal um, success or personal enjoyment and trying to share that. So that, that's what I'm trying to do, which sounds quite bizarre. But I think that will extend. My, I want to run for as long as I can, and if I keep pushing at the levels I am now, I'm going. I'm, I'm breaking down 
regularly now. So to extend my enjoyment of my running, I need to be a, a lot more relaxed with my performance. How do you... I mean, is that, that's a hard thing to navigate. That's very hard, yeah. really hard. And, and my mind still wants to run fast, but my body isn't allowing me to. So at some stage, you know, I've got to, I've got to just balance that out. And I still want to put, and I will still push myself, but it's doing within, doing that within the boundaries on certain occasions when, again, when my training is dictating that I can push a bit harder, then I will, but I don't want to be under pressure because most events I go to now, there's an expectation that I will still run fast and be pretty competitive. So I'm trying to reverse that where I go to an event, if, if I'm in good shape, I'll run, but don't expect that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's difficult. But when where you've been, where where I've come from, you know what I what do I tell people? I'm I'm on a roll now. I have got the greatest role and succession going of anyone, Brad, because I am running a PW every run I go out. A personal <laughs> worst. Seriously, I'm on a roll. I've run a personal worst longer and, and con- more continually than anyone in history of running. <laughs> well, and That's a fact. Well, so, mate, uh, that's a credit to you. Maybe that's one of your career-defining mo- you know, highlights yeah. because you are still out there doing it and loving it. I yeah. think, mate, you know, irrespective of your times, and that's the personal journey you're on trying to navigate the expectations of yourself, but mm. you know, the world, the running world, looks to Steve Monaghetti, and I hear it all the time when you're in events and you're featuring here and there. It's like... Monas is he's still running so fast. Yeah, well, so you know your personal benchmarks are you know it's all relative for the world looking on. All we know is Steve Monaghetti, the elite runner. Yeah, whether you went out and ran eighteen minutes for five or twenty five minutes or thirteen fifty for five, it's you know still Steve Monaghetti. So yeah. not to me feels different for you. <laughs> but isn't this a fascinating dichotomy, Steve? Uh, one bit of training advice for listeners: what would it be if you boiled oh. down everything and you could only yeah. give one bit of advice to help yeah. people perform yeah. at their best? Yeah, what would it be? Run three quarters of your race distance regularly. Run three quarters of your. Can you expand on that, please? So, if you want to run a marathon, you need to be doing 35k runs regularly. If you want to run a half marathon, you need to be doing whatever three, you know, 16k runs regularly. Just so your body. And I can give you a practical example of this. If I don't run for a while I come back the first run I run 5k it feels like it's an eternity and then if I've trained for a while so you know you get back into the groove and you start doing some longer runs two months later you're running 20k just like it was the 5k run so your body does get attuned to distance it's already the body is a great adapter but you've got to expose it to allow it to adapt if you want to run a 21k race and you're running 10k it doesn't matter how fast you're running it because you're not going your body hasn't adapted to that extra distance yeah and does it have to be at any certain intensity of effort steve no i actually think run slow Run slow. Yeah, because I actually like what you... I I don't know if it'll actually work because I I can't work it out, but you almost need to be on your legs as long as... So if you want to run a two-hour half marathon, you should run your 16 or 17K run in two hours. So the time Mm. is about the time you're going to take, but obviously it's at the slower speed because you're not running that fast. time on your feet. Time on legs, yeah. Yeah, time on legs. Um, Monas... If you could have dinner, fun question with three people, living or past, who would be at that dinner table and why? Oh, gee. Um, Edward Flack. Edward Flack. Because he's our legend. He started the Olympic tradition that is Australia's um, involvement at Olympic every Olympic game since, so he'd be great. Yep. Um, uh, Bob Geldof probably because he changed the world from a you know he had a really difficult background and you know through what he did at band-aid love him or hate him for his attitude and that he made a significant world difference one one guy making a difference and um, probably i think uh, martina navratilova because Mm -hmm. i think she revolutionized uh, female tennis and uh, so I really admired her when I was growing up so that would be a pretty good and yourself there that's a pretty uh, a pretty uh, dynamic table Monas <laughs> yep. be some interesting conversation imagine Martina and Bob yeah, Geldof. Geldof that'd be, ooh, there'd, be some, there'd be some controversy out of there you'd want to you'd want to have the podcast of that one I reckon oh it'd be great mate and lastly uh, if you could issue listeners with a physical challenge for the week from Steve Monaghetti it can be entry level or it can be very difficult. It can be a bit of fun. What would you like to challenge listeners listening to get out and do in the seven days off the back of this episode going live? Right, okay, that's good. I think um, 
I certainly think that, you know, that Gamudi session that I mentioned where you're running a couple of laps fast, that's really difficult. And so what I would challenge people, especially if, if I'm assuming most people are running or exercising, I would challenge yourself to do a session that isn't at race pace. It's at uh, a lot slower than race pace, close to race pace, and faster than race pace. Mm. Do that as a session in the next seven days. Wow. Unbelievably hard but some really good um, um, mental stimulation and physical benefit in doing that. And uh, listeners, if you do take on Monas's challenge there, be sure to uh, let us know. Tag us in on social media. Where can we find you on social, Steve? We can oh, find you. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I'm on all of those and email as well. So yeah. I'm pretty – I think I've still got the same mobile I've had for about 40 years. So people seem to ring me. They still find me. But uh, one thing I, I love, you know, I'm pretty approachable. So you know where people can find me. Yep. And at a race nearby soon. <laughs> yeah, That'll definitely. be where I'll be. Steve will be popping up here. Yeah. Um, Monas, uh, yeah, we will, and listeners, we'll tag up all Steve's you know, handles in the show notes, so jump over and have a listen at, uh, look there for anything you need to connect with Steve on. Um, but that just prompted me. There was that Merck that you said you won when you won, I think, mm-hmm. the Berlin Marathon. Mm-hmm. Uh, that just re- flicked something in my head. Did You you drove that for quite a yeah, period yeah. of time. What's the story with years. that? Yeah, yeah, so I kept it. Now, one story I do tell about that, I don't know how long we've got here. I'm, I'm killing your time. But no, you I remember, um, uh, so we didn't actually get the, so I, I won a 300E or something, and by the time we worked out to bring it back to Australia, put sort of pay in duty and change it, we had to put some anti-pollution gear or something on it. So we th- we just took the money. So it was about sixty three grand, and we actually went to Mercedes in Australia and said, "Well, here's our money. Can, what do we get?" And it was you know one ninety e, and it was, and I was really happy with that. So I got downsized a bit, but it was still pretty good. <laughs> and I remember um, uh, I must have been overseas or something, and I um, so they delivered. They were in Melbourne, so they delivered it to the airport and. They left the keys at, at the, you know, the, one of the uh, rental car companies and I grabbed the keys. And I remember going out to the Melbourne Airport car park and I, I found they'd left where it was, so I found the car. And um, anyway, we went out. And this was in the days when we had toll booths. So to get out of the car park, I had to go up to the toll booth and, and pay the toll to get out. Anyway, um, I, go, I drove up in this new car. I'm thinking, how good is this? And I got there and it didn't have, I couldn't find the winder to wind down the window. So I actually had to get out of the car and pay the guy the money to get out of the car park and then jump back in and of course it had electronic windows but I, I wasn't used to the buttons so it was too um too fancy for me so i'm sure that guy at the toll booth thinking this guy's nicked this mercedes benz he's stolen it well i'm gonna have to report him so and I, as i say you know i was i was really um, delighted to have that and i never thought i'd be driving mercedes benz so i kept it for 15 years so i got it in 91 i think february 91 and an upgrade in about 2006 to another mercedes which my daughter's now driving and um so that's we've sort of con- kept the continuity going a little bit but i did mention the other day i just traded in that the yeah. original merc uh, someone's obviously driving that around i'd be, I was gonna be say, a collector's where is item it? where now, is it what color is it so it's uh well what color i would say i would say gray <laughs> yep um some people would say silver mercedes-benz said anthracite right so well there you go listeners if you're out there and you can cite this car do let us know take a photo and post it on social we'd love to know where the the uh the, the berlin marathon winning vehicle is so Correct. that would be quite a find if it we would be. discover yep. it mr steve monaghetti uh you are so generous with your time and uh such an incredible ambassador for the sport so mate on behalf of certainly myself you also did pace me to my nearly my first marathon my first marathon at the gold coast nearly here. doesn't nearly, sound I know, like it was going well like a good outcome. Had a few k's to go yeah. but 301 30 i came in i was a bit raw i didn't know what i was doing but i thought if i can find the pace man steve monaghetti i'll be right yep just so jump I on my jumped shoulders in behind you yep. and i think i tripped you at about the 15k oh, right. and you okay. swallowed water and the balloon was banging my head yeah, yeah but mate um yeah. i want to say thanks for that you nearly got me there I, you got me there i just my training let me down um but uh also thanks for the time tonight and no worries enjoy the sport and thanks. i love what i do it's great to share it and um hopefully you know there'll be some people out there who got some benefit out of it but also enjoy our love of running you're absolute legend thanks mr monaghetti cheers brad good on you mate Listeners, there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I trust you enjoyed this very special episode of the Physical Performance Show featuring an Australian sporting and running legend, 
none other than Monaghetti, Mr. Steve Monaghetti. Uh, if you'd also like to hear from another running Australian legend, be sure to jump back and check out uh, two interviews, three interviews in particular, three of the runners that Steve referenced in uh, his interview. Uh, firstly, Rob Deke De Costello, who featured on episode 37. Also, Benita Willis, who uh, Mono's referenced there for her incredible world cross-country title. Benita featured in episode, or on episode 20, and also there, uh, Craig Mottram, who Mona's referenced as uh, such a great athlete, one of the toughest, and also the one that inspired him the most, who featured, uh, Mottram featured on episode, Craig Mottram, that is, on episode 24. So be sure to jump back over, listeners, and enjoy those episodes if you're yet to hear from those Aussie running legends. A massive thank you to you, the faithful listener who make the show possible week to week. If it's your first time on the program, I hope you enjoyed it, got a lot out of it. If you you are a regular listener and up to episode 54 doing the journey with the show, uh, then thank you for your support over what's been the first year. There's a lot more great uh, sharings to come in this calendar year, which is 2017. Massive thanks to the show's team, Daryl Misson, audio engineer extraordinaire, and Susan Wilkin, the show's VA, who really is the mechanics of this program, and both of you make it possible, guys, for this to go live every week, so massive thank you. Listeners, if you'd like to subscribe to the show, the benefit there is it pops it into your device each week without you having to go searching for it, then simply hit subscribe inside iTunes or any of the apps that you're using to listen to the program within. And guys, if you're into running, I presume you might be, uh, given that this episode featured a living legend, Monaghetti, then uh, be sure to jump over and pick up a copy of my Amazon running and jogging bestseller. You can run pain free. It's 330 pages packed full of information built around a five-step framework that's a proven process that I've used for the better part of a decade in the physio practice working with runners and triathletes of all different abilities. It's available from pogophysio.com.au to distribute internationally, also over on Amazon, and now also available while you're on the run via iBooks or Audible. If you enjoyed today's episode with Steve Monaghetti, be sure to let us know. Uh, Steve will really appreciate anything that you share in terms of a takeaway or a key learning that you've had. Uh, or if you just want to say thanks to Steve's remarkable contribution to the running community and also his, or just acknowledge his career, then be sure to do that. You'll find our social media handles inside the show notes over at pogophysio.com.au. And if you take on Steve's Mona's challenge for the week, with that session that he outlined, be sure to tag Steve and myself in as well and let us know what you got up to. Lastly, if you're into running and you'd like to enjoy injury-free and faster running, then be sure to check out my Amazon running and jogging bestseller. It's 330 plus pages, packed full of a five-step process that as a physiotherapist I've used over the last decade to help runners do just what they cover and title declares, run pain-free. So you can pick that up over at pogophysio.com.au in paperback version or via Amazon, or alternately, if you like to get it in your ears as you move or run, it's now also available over on Audible or iBooks. Coming up in next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, I catch up with an Ironman triathlon champion. So we go from one endurance champion Steve Monaghetti to the next and we're talking with next week Burks, Tim Van Burkle. Burks is a Ironman champion, he's on the rise and Tim shares openly around his journey of uh, almost like a meteoric rise to becoming an Ironman champion in the 3.8 180 marathon run distance through to a bit of a dry spell which lasted many many years and then finally a breakthrough in Cairns in 2015, the Ironman held here on Australian shores. Tim also shares around his goals for the Hawaiian Ironman triathlon, the granddaddy of them all, and some of the frustrations and the key learnings he's had on outings to the big island uh, so far. So be sure to tune in next week to catch up with Tim Van Berkel. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.